Fullway. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Hilliard. I'm a master here on the Arcanum. And tonight we're going to talk about my personal recipe that I use for um, moving my images from the camera to the computer, as well as how I set up my uh, raw image library. Um, and in this process, I'm going to introduce you to a new piece of software called Ingestomatic. Um, it's a very inexpensive little utility. I believe it costs like $25. And at the end, I will show you uh, their web page. Okay? So without any further ado, let me just share my desktop here, and we will jump right into it. All right. Um, the first thing I'm going to share with you is I'm going to show you my actual uh, library structure. And it starts in a directory called Capture. Yours could start anywhere. Mine is just called Capture. And then my images at this point are subdivided by year. So currently on this computer I have my 2015 and 2016 images. And as my drive on the computer starts to fill up, then I will take the older ones off, which I just did about two weeks ago. All right. Then, now remember, this is my raw library structure, okay, for the raw images. In 2016, um, I further have them subdivided according to cameras. Now, so far in 2016, I've only shot with one camera, the Sony A7R2. And here you can see its directory. There's also a directory called January. If I shoot any videos whatsoever, which I did here, of the, we had like 18-foot waves hitting the, um, on one of the piers on Sunday morning when we were out shooting on the workshop, and I wanted to document those huge waves, um, I will take videos. Um, it will create a, a, a month directory and put all of the videos in the month directory, all of the still images will go into um, this directory that has my camera name, A7R2. Underneath that, it's further divided by months. So here you can see, since we're in 2016, we have a January directory, and then under that, all of the images can be found that I took uh, during this month, okay? Um, I'm going to jump back here and I'm going to go into the 2015 directory so that you can see how populated it gets. A7R2, iPhone, the, the Fuji IR X100S camera, the monochrome Leica, a Nikon 120, I have lots of cameras, a, a Fuji X-T1, um, my uh, scanner, the Epson V850 for when I scan my film, and so on and so on. Um, uh, there's also a, a, a M240 buried in here somewhere. Um, up there it is. Okay, so if we look into those directories, then you can see the months that I shot. And now if I go into a specific directory, um, let's 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 just pick one of these guys out here. This is a picture of the Glade Creek grist mill. Now I want you to notice the file name. Okay, the file name starts with the, the camera name M240, and then there's a dash, and then there's the four-digit serial number that the camera applies to each image. All right, then I have um, an EXIF data spot in here where I put my shutter speed in there. Um, and then I have um, what's known as a job code. This was during a West Virginia workshop on Thursday. And then it has the year. Now, are you curious at all how I came across these, um, these data points to build this file name and how I built the file name? Do you think 
that I did this all by hand? Well, the answer is no, I did not. To achieve this workflow and this file directory structure, this is all automatic for me. All right. Um, and what happens is, how I achieve this is I bought this little utility right here called Ingestomatic. Um, it costs $25, and what it is, is it is a reader to read the image files off the camera's memory card, build the image library structure. If the, the directories aren't there, it will put them there. Um, change the, the, the name of the uh, image and write it into the proper directory, and it does this all automatically. Um, so the first thing that you saw that came up, it came up and asked me what memory card I wanted to read. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any memory cards with any images on them. Um, but one of the things that I can do, let's close it down again and start it up so you can see it as it comes up. There it is in Justomatic is you can choose your input. Now, if I had a camera memory card, it would show up here. Uh, but I can click on other, and then I can click on a directory. And we're gonna, we're gonna say open this abstract directory. And this is just the same now as if I had opened a memory card in. Okay? Um, this does a number of things. Uh, first and foremost, it opens what we call a set. And you notice that the images, none of them are selected. So I can go in and I can, I can select this one and then check it. And when I went to ingest it, it would copy this image in, create the proper directory structure if it wasn't created, and change the name as I have programmed them, them to be changed. Or I could say select all and check all and now it would take all of these water drop images that I've got in this directory and it would read them in and write them to the proper directory uh, with the proper file name but in order to do that I have I have put in a macro here called CF shoot and what this is is a job code and I've said that it's required so it will not ingest any images till I tell it what I'm ingesting so I double click on that and I would say water drops. Okay, and now I could go in and I could click on the, ing the ingest button and it would read all of those files in, change the names and put them in the proper directories. Well, you ask, how in the earth does it know what to do? We have instruction sets over here. And this sounds very complicated, but it's very, very simple. If I click on set, this is where everything is set up. Um, and this is, remember I said I had a capture directory? This is the path to the start of my raw library. Um, users, Mark Hilliard, pictures, raw image, library, and then capture. This is the capture is the first thing that we see. Okay, and then I can click on a backup or a second backup. So it'll make up to two discrete copies of these images as you're ingesting them to external drives, should you choose to do it that way. Now, the folder arrangement, do you remember I said that the folders could be created automatically if they're not already created, like if a new year comes or a new camera comes or a new month comes. So this is what I've done. These are called programming tokens. I simply select them out of a macro list. Okay. Um, any of these things I can have. Okay. And what I've done is I said I want my first directory to be the year in four digit numerical value. So you saw that I had a 2016 directory, right? And then I wanted it by the camera model. I wanted this 
to intelligently separate everything by cameras. And I've got a lookup table called lookup TIFF model. Now that is something that we're going to come back to. I'm going to show you how I built this so it can differentiate different cameras. And then I wanted it further subdivided by the month in a three character uh, alpha. So this would be JAN for January. And that's how it creates the subdirectories for me. And it knows all of this by year and month and TIFF, uh, the, the, the TIFF model and the date of the image because it reads that from the XIF data in every single image that it imports, okay? <clears throat> it's quite intelligent. And it's simply a matter of if I wanted to, to change or add anything to the directory structure, I just go down these lists and I'll pick one and it'll put it right in here and then you can move them around. Then it's going to rename the file name and again I want the very first portion of the file name to be my camera and then I want the second part of the file name to be that four digit serial number that the camera applies to each image. And then I have another one stuck in here. I, want, I, I, I do so many long exposures that I need to know the shutter speed in my image title name. So I have shutter speed, and then I told it to look up in the EXIF data the exposure time, and it will write it into the file name. And then it's going to look up the CF shoot. Now the CF shoot is that job code that we entered right here. That's where that comes from. And then lastly, um, the, the four-digit year. Now, the reason I added the four-digit year to the end of the file names and is, as you know, the camera can count up from 0 to 9,999. Well, on some years, I might exceed that, and that number is going to roll over again. So that means now that I could have two <coughs> file names with the same four-digit serial number. And just having this year here allows me to differentiate it from the other one. Okay, the job code will also differentiate. Um, and these are, again, you, you simply select these by going to the macro list and picking them, and it'll put them here in this space for you. And then we can go a little bit further. We can add other um, XF information here and make it mandatory. So it puts my name in the file. It puts my copyright notice uh, according to the current year. Um, it puts my uh, web page on it and it puts the date that the image was created. Okay. And you can fill these out. But with CF shoot, I just simply put this macro in here at required so that it forces you to enter it here before you ingest any single image. Okay. Now I want to touch on one more thing real quick. This lookup camera model. Um, a lot of cameras have a distinct serial number. And there's another macro that you can look it up by the serial number and have it replace it with a camera model. So you could have a 7D number one or a 7D number two. Um, but a lot more cameras don't have that serial number uh, for the camera built into the XIF data. So they give you another way to differentiate from uh, between cameras. And it's called lookup TIFF model. And what you do is every time you get a new camera, we have to go into the lookup tables and then select camera model. And then you have to, to put a key in here. And you get this information from the EXIF data. When you, when you plug in a memory card with a picture on it from the camera, all you do is look at the EXIF data and read out what the camera actually named itself. Okay? Um, so for the new Sony, Sony puts ILCE-7RM2, and I told it to replace that with A7R2. Um, iPhone 5, iPhone 6, 
just put iPhone, Leica, the Leica M Type 240, just make that to M240. Same thing with the Leica Monochrome, make it Monochrome MM. Um, now, if you have a camera that's converted to infrared, like the, um, the X100S, okay, you can tell it to, to rename that to IR X100S, okay? Yes. And then once you've created this and say, okay, then you're going to, you've got everything done here. You're simply going to go down to defaults and say save as and give it the, the default file name, D-E-F-A-U-L-T, okay? And then it's saved and you won't lose them. One other thing this utility will do for you is it will geotag by clicking this link, okay? Um, it turns the ability on to synchronize your images with the latitude and longitude where you were when you took them. Um, does that make sense to you guys, what this does and how it does it? Um, it looks very complicated, but it's actually quite simple. Um, so let's stop the screen share. Um, let's see, I've lost a couple of people. We've got Morgan, we've got Linda still. Um, you guys can hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, does that make any sense to you? It does. Yeah. It's it's very very simple. Um, the utility costs next to nothing. Like I said, it's about twenty five dollars, um, and it simplifies your life in an amazing way when it comes to building your raw library tree. Um, a lot of folks out there use Lightroom. Um, I am not a Lightroom user. I do not care for Lightroom. Uh, and there's a couple good reasons for that. First and foremost is it's an 8-bit editor rather than a 16-bit, even though it will export your images to an 8-bit editor or an 8-bit plug or a 16-bit editor or a 16-bit plug-in filter. Um, if you bring that image back in and do any more editing on it, it's just going to create an 8-bit image. And an 8-bit image is okay. Um, it gives you 16 million discrete colors that it's capable of recording. Um, but a 16-bit image gives you 4.3 billion colors. I'm all about the quality. I want to get the, the most that I can possibly get out of any of the cameras that I use. So I always shoot in RAW, and I always edit in Photoshop. Now, I do like the librarian in Lightroom, but I don't use it. I use Bridge as my librarian, and I use the Ingestomatic to create the library file structure. Um, and after you do it one time, it becomes really, really simple to use, and the new file name types um, make them very, very intelligent so that you can go back and find the raw file should you edit them because you know the year and you know that four-digit uh, serial number that the camera applies. And also, you get to, to name those raw files into something intelligent. I mean, each raw file has, like I said, it's got the camera name, it's got that four-digit camera serial number that it applies, it's got a job code, um, it's got a year in it, it, it and there's hundreds of things that you can put in that file name by going through those macro drop-downs and choosing them. Um, do you have any questions so far about using the Ingestomatic and the raw library tree and how I, I use the software and manipulate it? I don't have any questions. I'm thrilled to find someone else who doesn't like Lightroom, though. Oh yeah, you'll you'll find that there's a lot of us here that don't like it. Um, it has it, it is a powerful piece of software and it has a place in the photographic world, just not in mine. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to I've I've taken your advice and gotten away from Lightroom and just, I'm just using Photoshop, but you know this helps because I've got to figure out a way. Like I said when we talked the first.
come up with a workflow that's that's usable and the camera file names that you get are you know it's from my Canon or just they don't make any sense so I end up putting things into directories that make sense to me and then I lose stuff because I have things I tend to do things by uh, type of photo like if I go to a car show and I'm shooting cars or if I'm mm -hmm. you know you go to Yosemite or wherever I'm at I tend to do it by where I shoot not necessarily time frames and things because I remember where I was but I don't shoot as much as you do yeah well you know and that's a very valid point um, I do that I do just the same as you but in my edited file tree I have two file trees one for my raw images that's the, 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 those are a gift from God and we can't touch those right but when I edit one, I have a second file tree that I can. And let me drop in and, and show you that real quick, okay? Let me bring the screen back on. Drop you down. Let me bring Bridge back up. Um, so this is my capture file tree, like I showed you. Year, camera name, month, and then the images. See, A7R2. Four-digit serial number, shutter speed is one two fiftieth, <clears throat> and then the job code. Okay, so then I have a second file tree where I do what you do. It's called my master output prints, and if I go to my my master sizes, um, I divide by subject matter. Now everything in here is divided according to subject type okay so like I have a strange people oh, I don't have anything in there because I just upgraded and uh, backed all of this up let's go to long exposure I know that there'll be something there okay so now these are the same files that, that you saw before all right um, these are all long exposures, and I still maintain the same file naming. MM, it was for the Leica monochrome, the four-digit serial number, shutter speed, my job code. Now I change it to something more specific. So this would have just been Outer Banks Workshop. And, but I, I, when I go to save it after I edit them in Photoshop, I will change that Outer Banks workshop to the Roanoke's Marsh's Lighthouse. Okay, uh, here's another one uh, from another workshop. This is uh, uh, everything's the same, but I change that job code to what I'm actually looking at Ravenel Bridge. Okay, Polly's Pier, Duggars Creek Falls. Um, but yet, if you notice up here, master output print, master sizes, then uh, this is how I size them coming out of the camera, 8.5 by 12.5. Although that's really no longer true because as these cameras grow in resolution, these file sizes go up. And then according to subject matter. If I go back here, you mean I've got alternative prints, I've got animals, um, if I go into animals, I have subdirectories, beach life, butterflies, deer, on and on and on and on, okay? Whales, so I've got pictures of whales in here, okay? And that's how, and these have all been edited. They're all ready to print or modify for print, okay? Um, I even have a directory for frogs, okay, because I do lots of frog photography. Mark, are you also tagging them, or are you just putting them in these directories? I also tag them, and I'm using the tagger that's built into um, Bridge. And if you go look, for those of you who, who don't use this, um, you can have uh, an EXIF uh, panel where you can, um, oh, here it is. Let's just bring it up. Window. the keywords panel. Let's bring it over so you can see the keywords. And I don't have the keywords set up. This just upgraded, so I just lost all my keywords. But it's very simple to add keywords. And you'll find that you'll get end up with hundreds of keywords. And then if I pick an image, I, I will simply cl click on the, the, the various keywords 
that apply to that image, and it's applied to it, and they're there permanently now. It's written into the EXIF data, okay? So, yeah, you can use um, a bridge to do keywording just as easily as you can use uh, Lightroom, okay? Um, but this is how I set up my output print files. So they start here. Um, I have copy work, which is commercial work that I do for artists. I separate out family images, okay. Um, then I have my master sizes, which is everything. And then I do a lot of gallery wrap work. Um, you guys know what gallery wraps are? Um, they're, they're canvas prints stretched around the outside of a frame and hung on the wall that way. And I sell these 90% of the time. It's very rare I sell anything framed or matted. Um, I'll go to a show with this black box size, 23 by 31 inch frame. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, it's a 23 by 31 inch print that's wrapped around a frame that's 19 and a quarter by 28 and 7 eighths. And nobody's asked me what black box means. Um, when I do sh shows, I have these big toolboxes that are plastic that I buy with wheels and handles, and they're really heavy. And you can buy them at Lowe's and Home Depot. Well, they'll hold an image that size. So I call these my black box size images because I can put them in there and wheel them around. And I'll typically take 53 of these images to a show and sell every single one of them for $250 a piece. But these are sized to fit the box. Normally, I tell everybody that if you're going to size an image, let's go here, to, to keep your master sizes and then upsize them or downsize them, um, as necessary for the particular print job. But I print so many um, gallery wraps that I, I, I have directories that I've already pre-sized them. I have 16 by 16s, 20 by 15s, black box. Um, I have giant panoramas that are 20 by 50, um, 15 by 15s, uh, 20 by 20. And so these are all pre-sized. These, these are ready to go. So, I mean, I've got these these giant, well, that's the wrong one. Let's see here. Super panoramas, 20 by 50s. So I do these. I, I sell a lot of these as well, okay? So I have them all pre-sized and ready to go, okay? Those are gallery wraps also? Yes, these are all gallery wraps. These are sizes under my gallery wrap directory. Okay, and then I do these. I do these montages. They're triptychs. Okay, where I will cut that image up into three parts, see them, and then they will get mounted on three separate twenty by fifty gallery wrap frames, and they're hung in the in the buyer's home about four inches between them. So I'm doing those as well. All right. But that's how I set up my master output library. And these are images that are all set up and ready to go to the printer. Okay. Um, let me bring my Hangout back up, stop the screen share. So you, you, you see, Morgan, I do the same thing that you do, but I don't do it in the raw library, I do it in the finished library, the, the, the library of images that have been post-processed and ready to print, okay? Um, now, I also do my own printing. Hi, Joe. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, uh, I, one of the things that I own is I, I own a G. Clay printing service here in Polly's Island. And I have two very large printers. I have a 24-inch and a 44-inch printer that I'm running. That They're Epson printers. I, I like the Epson line the best. Of course, it helps that the CEO of Epson America is, is a cousin. Oh. So that makes a difference. I have a little bit of an insight there. Um, 
but I run them using something called a RIP, a raster image processor. And it's a piece of software that sits between the computer and the printer. So it sits in the middle here, okay? And it, it reads the image stream coming to the printer and it changes it. It changes how the printer prints. Instead of a single pass across and printing it, it could go hundreds of times across. And it mixes the inks, it's more archival. Um, I have um, ICC profiles for every type of media made in the world. There are thousands and thousands of them. And for each media, we'll do one to display in sunlight, incandescent light, fluorescent light, so it has multiples for the same um, uh, media, if you will, for different styles and types of lighting that the, that the end user is going to display them in. Um, so I, I also do that, and that piece of software costs as much as the printer does too. Um, and it has a key to enable it. Uh, it's got a, a USB dongle. In order to use the, 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 the RIP, you have to plug it into the side of the computer. And those dongles live in a safe leg bolted to the floor of my uh, studio. Because if you lose those, the company says, too bad, buy it again. So I'm very careful with those. Um, but that in a nutshell then are the two libraries, my raw library and my post-process library. So can I answer any questions at this point? I came in late, but I've started using the uh, auto ingester software. Did you, did you, were you a little put off by it at first? No, it's a little, there's a couple of little quirks in it. When I, I'm up to 2012 in terms of, so I've still got a huge, huge backlog of stuff to do. But when I get into a file that's got mixed, like scanner output and um, camera output stuff, a lot of times it, it confuses uh, required fields, so I have to kind of erase those and go in and hand enter all of the information. Yeah, um, I have but, the same problem with scanner output because it doesn't put XF information into the files. Right. But other than that, it's 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 great. I, 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 I've been working with it now since you mentioned it in a Hangout, I guess about a month ago or so. Um, and like I said, I'm up to 2012 in my library, so I got a I got a ways to go. Which one are you using, Ingestomatic or Image Ingester? Ingestomatic. Yeah, that's the best one. And I just got a note a few minutes ago that there's a new version of that for Windows users that that uh, make it much easier to use and much faster. I'm on a Mac, so. Yeah, me too. Guy, when I have. When I've had problems, the guy that, that wrote it, or the, the owner of the Ingestomatic, he's he's pretty quick about getting back to you. Yeah, he's he's, he's, helpful. he's a wonderful software vendor. I started with um, uh, Image Ingester from him, and I had so many issues and wanted so many changes that he went out and he wrote Ingestomatic uh, for me. Um, oh. That's how Ingestomatic came into being, and Ingestomatic, I mean, it doesn't cost much money, and the image ingester costs a bunch of money, and Ingestomatic does way more. Okay. I looked, I, I downloaded both of them on the trial and looked at them, and Ingestomatic was exactly what I was after, so. Mm -hmm. um, but I also use it for geocoding. Did any of you geocode? Some of my later stuff has it, but um, I didn't buy the 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 cards that, that were that could do it till later on, till about two years ago. Okay, um, I bought a little device called a Bad Elf Pro, B A D E L F Pro, and it's about this big. Um, it's it's an oval, and it's it's a high speed GPS that does breadcrumb trails and the batteries in it last for 40 hours of continuous use. And I have it set up to do a timestamp every 10 seconds. So as I'm traveling, 
Um, it will make this bread trail of crumbs, if you will, that follow me, whether I'm walking or in a car or in an airplane. So what I do then is I set the time on my cameras because it, it, it syncs up the, um, the camera image to the breadcrumb trail by the timestamp that's in, in on the image. So it's very important that you have the time accurately set in your camera and you 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 don't set it to um, update for um, jumping back or jumping forward for daylight savings time. You want you, you want it to be off an hour uh, during one of those uh, winter or summer. And then what happens is the um, GPS obviously is going to give you time stamps on Greenwich Mean Time. And then you tell Ingestomatic that uh, you are five hours off of Greenwich Mean Time, and it'll go through and it'll, it'll geotag every image that comes in. And I find that very, very handy because I can look at an image and then bring up on a map exactly where it was taken. All right. I mean, it can do other things as well. Um, how many of you like to have maps of your trips? Uh, well, this is the way to do it. Let me screen share one more time. And I'm not going to bring up Image Ingester or Ingestomatic. I have a little My Tracks program here that I have downloaded all of the. Um, uh, the tracks into for about the past two years and then uh, I'll go down here and I'll select the tracks um, and I've got these going back to 2014 um, but let's just do just the workshop that we did uh, last week okay And I'll take this window back down, and then I'm going to zoom out. And for the workshop, it started here, and it went up here. Okay, now as I zoom in, this all comes from that little GPS device, okay? You can start to see more detail in, in the places that we went uh, for the workshop. So I can zoom in a little bit more. Up comes the map, and you can see when we're at the at the Body Island Lighthouse, we drove in, and then I walked around the lighthouse like this, and I took pictures all around, and wherever I was in this trail, it time-stamped uh, that image for me. Another day, we went over here to this lighthouse. This, this was called the Roanoke Marshes Lighthouse, and we were right here. We took picture, pictures of this lighthouse at sunrise, and the sun was rising right out here. And we had the lighthouse as a foreground. Um, but I can always go over these images, or, or these uh, breadcrumb trails, and I can look at my travels that way. And it's, it's kind of nice to have a record of that. Is it necessary? No, it's not necessary. Um, so Mark, and if you post your photo online, do you have to, and you don't want people to know the location, do you have to remember to erase it? No. If you do a save at, there's a GP, uh, uh, JPG mode where you, you save for web, and it strips all of that data out of it. Okay. Okay. So there, I've loaded uh, two years worth of travel. Okay, and you can see that I've got lots in the United States. I've got a bunch over here in Europe. Um, uh, let's see, Scotland, Ireland. Um, for some reason, uh, my Italy and, and uh, Greek, Greece aren't here, but, I mean, here's out in San Francisco. Here's up in Alaska. Um, and it, it, it creates a travel log for you that enables you to keep track of where you were Helps you remember the trip a lot better, too. Uh, but more importantly, it does that all-important geotag. It tags those images with the lat long. 
<coughs> and you can do this with any GPS that would do a bread crawl for you and save a, um, a GPX file. Um, but it, it enables you to, to do this breadcrumbing, and it's very powerful. It, it is a very, very good utility. Um, so that's how I do things. That's how I set up my libraries. That's how I um, do the, um, uh, my ingesting. And uh, I'm going to save this intro um, on, our, on our cohort page. Um, but there's also, I did a DVD tutorial set that I sell. Um, uh, I don't sell it to you guys. You guys pay enough money to be here. Um, and I, I suck out certain chapters and put it up there. So you'll notice that there's an infrared chapter one and an infrared chapter two for post-processing infrared that you have, you have access to. There's also a chapter on there for using the, the image ingester and ingestomatic. So I'll pull that off and make that available to you as well. And that goes into more detail on how to set it up. Um, it, it does look a little imposing when you first look at it, but it's very, very easy. It is. And there are so many ways to program it, and it's so easy to program. You'll go in and you'll try it one way, and next month you'll say, oh, I want, I want something different on my image name, and you'll take a, a token away and add another token or two. And eventually you get to the point that you find that you've got the, the library the way you want it, and you have the file names the way you want it. Um, but it makes, it makes my life much easier. It's a very um, intelligent, intuitive way to set up that library and to give those raw library files an intelligent name that allows you to go and search them easier. Okay? Um, any other questions? No. Nope. All right. Well, I, I know that uh, Andy came in uh, late, Joe, you came in late, but this is being recorded on YouTube, and in, in a day or two I'll have it posted on the cohort, okay? So I'm going to stop the broadcast here. Oh, you know, before I do that, um, let, let me say that everybody has their own way of doing things. And my way is my way. Um, the fact that I, that I show you guys what I'm doing, it's not that I'm trying to force feed you. Um, I'm just telling you how I do it and the reasons why I do it. And maybe you'll pick a piece here and a piece there and work it into your workflow. And one day you might decide to do a hangout with us all and tell us how you do your workflow. And I might take a piece or two of yours as well. This is an evolving process. Um, I have been doing this a long, long time. I am a, a bit set in my ways, but I do learn uh, from everybody that, that is here and from the people that attend my workshops as well. Uh, and that's the nice thing about this. Uh, it's a lifelong learning thing, and I'm not removed from learning as well. Uh, so take it as it's meant. It's a suggestion and a description of how I do it. It may work for you, it may not, but it's something for you to think about. All right? <laughs>